but we thank you that we can celebrate the feast of unleavened bread the feast of holiness the feast of deliverance the feast of freedom the feast of being set free we claim your Holy Spirit moving in our midst as a free gift by the sacrifice of Christ you have not only merited for us everlasting righteousness but caused us to receive freely the gift of the Holy Spirit the down payment of our redemption that that part of that divine trinity the everlasting part of your nature has been in, given unto us as a free gift that we can fellowship communion with talk with share with the power wisdom of the universe the third person of the blessed trinity the holy spirit we receive you as a gift tonight we receive you in your teaching capacity you will reveal to us the things of Christ as you've come to cause us to experience that which we have seen by the manifestation of the Son who came to reveal the Father. So give us tonight ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to grasp the divine things that bring you great pleasure. For we desire to please you, O Most Heavenly Father. We commit to you this service our spirit our soul and our body to the furtherance of your kingdom and of your truth in Yeshua's name Amen, Amen. now uh, Raymond had a question so I'm gonna let you ask the question for those listening by tape as it goes out throughout the world so okay. express thyself what I need clarified <clears throat> speak up now he's got to hear you what I need clarified is what exactly it was from eternity and the creation of time and space what how was it eternity drawn away from or time and space drawn away from eternity but how I didn't quite grasp that a hundred percent you didn't grasp how the eternal who was everywhere created something that didn't exist in the expanse within the framework of who he was and where he is for him being everything it's kind of confusing isn't it yeah yeah it's amazing they used to teach it like this if we drew a circle and let this circle represent everything there is which is difficult to conceive but let's just assume for a minute that this was everything and of course anybody who knows anything about he who is everything knows that nothing exists but him nothing else existed but him he was the sum total of everything that existed so if he created something how could he bring forth something that didn't exist since he was all that existed and he is everything and still is remembering that we gave you the scripture earlier that said we live move and have our being in him so whatever he is it's contained within him so the way they developed it is is that somewhere he withdrew a portion of his everything until there was a vacuum <coughs> and then he poured himself into that vacuum so that he who was everything known as Yahweh began to demonstrate his creative ability known as Elohim thereby creating a masterpiece of creation thereby creating the heavens and the earth yet all of this contained within him so if I were to really show this properly and scripturally actually what I do is simply show it going within so that a very small portion of the entire creation is still contained within him because he is everything he simply is manifesting that which is himself in a form that is different from him by the name of Elohim. He created, manifested it, and yet as we found out this afternoon that Paul said in Romans 1.20 that by everything he made, 
describes his nature and his deity. So that everything becomes a type and shadow of everything that he is as he then desires to redeem it and bring it up. Now, on this chart here, we had a chart that we used to teach a number of years ago as we came from the realms of eternity being the completeness without beginning, without end, essence of where there is no past and no future. Now, remember, that's hard for the human mind, but in deity, this is where he is. There is no past in him. There is no future in him. He is simultaneously, everything there is happening completely all the time in another dimension, in another realm, separate from... You and I only know time from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It does not exist in deity. He sees all things simultaneously, instantly. So as he looks down from eternity, he sees the whole thing. He's right now, just as present with Adam and even the garden, as he is coming the second time at the end of the tribulation. Or coming in the light. He sees it all simultaneously. So he can enter into any one of those time warps because he's above time. What he did is he created ages. And as we got into, as we closed the Bible study earlier, we were dealing with this age in which everything was created in a perfect state. There was no failure. There was no fault. There was no death. There was no sickness. There was no sin. There was no rebelliousness. It was a state of perfect existence in this realm, which then somewhere between eternity and Genesis 1-1, we have a period of time. Now, you don't hear this too much in churches. But as we explained earlier, that Christ is the manifestation side of deity. He came to manifest himself. He's called the Son because the Son manifests the Father. In his eternity, he came to manifest eternity. We have a chart that we used to show you that describes it to a certain detail. Find it real fast. Yeah, here it is. In the divine here we have a circle, semicircle, in which is the divine being, divinity eternity. Remember that charts do very poor damage to reality. I'm just trying to describe it. If you can conceive of everything there is in eternity, his divine divinity, his divine being, with a center of consciousness called Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son issuing forth from the divine being, manifesting, imaging the divine. He was the eternal Son from eternity. At some point, I hope you can follow me, at some point in eternity, not in time, Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning. But in order for there to be a beginning, there had to be somebody who was ready to do the beginning. Christ is called the beginning of the creation. That's one of his titles. So before there was a beginning, we have the Son being manifested in one of the higher dimensions as the son of Yahweh and he took on himself a divine humanity so he was in his pre-existent state as the second person of the Trinity he was the creator of all things and at some point he created the first Adam are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. So, Genesis 1-1 is preceded by the Son of Yahweh, Yeshua, coming forth, who is the second Adam, who is also the one who made the first Adam. So, Yeshua, known as the original Son, created the first Adam in His image while becoming the second Adam in which He came to redeem us which is one of the essences and meanings of the word Messiah. So, the Son manifesting Himself in a particular mode was able to manifest in eternity all of His glorious being and brought forth creations. In those creations, He brought forth 
beings of a different order. We read in the book of Job that the sons of Elohim, or sons of the Creator, sang and shouted at the foundations of the earth. In other words, when Father created this earth, Genesis 1, there were already beings here celebrating the act of creation. Okay? You can read this in Job uh, I think it's 38 correct me if I'm wrong creation was progressive no Job 38 verse 7 and if you really want to get the context of Job Job was trying to figure out why he was where he was which is what some of us try to do Finally, Yahweh is getting upset because his three friends were just fouling things up with their so-called knowledge of ignorance. Finally, it says, Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind, which was the pillar of cloud, and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel, who makes things even worse by talking about it? Words without knowledge. You know, you can have words without knowledge, the counsel. The more they talk, the worse it gets. Sometimes you think that's what I do. <laughs> Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where, was, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? He said, if you think you're so smart, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, Yahweh's asking him. He said, who do you think put this earth in this place in the first place? Who was it? Were you here? Where were you? What were you doing while I was doing this? Declare if you have any understanding. I mean, some of you ever get into the conversations that Yahweh has with humans? You talk about an encounter of the third kind, this was an encounter of the fourth kind. Uh -huh. <laughs> who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? In other words, who measured what size the earth would be? Who measured where the earth would be in place of the rest of the universe and the stars? Who, who decided that it should be here and not someplace else? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or, uh, how, how come the earth hangs where it is? Who fastened it here? He's trying to use his intelligence center to make him understand that it's not fastened at all. So by gravitational pull. Well, who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now there's the word cornerstone and Christ is the cornerstone. Who laid the cornerstone? When, quality of time, the morning stars sang together. That means there was a choir. Morning stars, plural. Now remember, we talked about earlier how Satan, before he fell, called Lucifer, wanted to get higher than he was in his created state. He wanted to ascend up into a higher heaven where the stars were, and yet these were one of the stars of that fourth dimension because we told you the fourth dimension is the dimension of the stars of heaven. The stars of heaven were created before the earth. If you remember in Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning Elohim created the, what? Heavens and the earth. What come first? Heavens or the earth? Heavens, heavens came first, then the earth. There's, a, there's an order. The heavens were plural. So he peopled the heavens before he finished peopling and making the earth. So he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth when the morning stars sang together? There were morning stars. Morning meaning... The beginning of light being made manifested. Morning stars. Stars who shine to bring light upon a particular form of the creation. When the morning stars sang together and all, how many? All, all of the sons of Elohim shouted for joy. There were sons of Elohim long before Adam was ever made. Know what it says? Now how many know the book of Job was written long before Moses was ever born? So the book of Job was here 500 years before Moses was ever here. This is the oldest book in your Bible. The book of Job was written over 2,000 years before Christ. The book of Job is the oldest book in your Bible. It's the first book we have of any recorded literature that ever got into the sacred canon. Job was pretty smart. In the book of Job, it tells you, the sons of Elohim shouted for joy when this earth was laid. So evidently there was a group of beings who were created by a direct fiat of Yahweh 
to exemplify His glory. He just simply said, let there be, whoop, there was an intelligent, wise, singing, powerful multiplicity of beings. He simply spoke it, whoop, millions of angels. B'nai Elohim, sons by creation. Now you and I are not sons by creation. We are sons by what? Birth. Which is higher? Birth. Birth. That's right. Birth sons have a higher calling than created sons. So these sons have been around for a while. Now, if the earth is, according to modern earth science, 15 to 18 billion years old, then these beings who have never sinned are still here in some dimension and they are still worshiping and singing to him and have been doing so for 15 to 18 billion years. They're not wore out at all. They have never died. They never get sick. They never get upset. They're very happy. Can we talk with them? They're with you. Can the B'nai Elohim flow in and amongst us? Now, let's go back to Job 1. Verse 6. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm teaching. I don't even know where I'm going, but I guess it's okay, right? <laughs> now, there was a day, Job 1, 6. Now, there was a day <clears throat> when the B'nai Elohim, sons of Elohim, now, who were they? They were here at the creation. They were here before Adam was ever made. They were here previous to Genesis 1-2. Are you with me? Okay. Now, there was a day when the B'nai Elohim came to present themselves before Yahweh. Not before Elohim. Before Yahweh. And who came? Satan. Satan came also among them. Why would Satan come among the B'nai Elohim? He, was, he, was one of them. he probably was one of them. He was probably a B'nai Elohim. No. Except for one problem. Isaiah 14, earlier, it said he wanted to go up and become like them. Since he refers to him as Satan instead of Lucifer, does this mean after he fell? Yes, this was after the fall. Well, that meant these B'nai Elohim came and presented themselves. Now, I've taken some of you up this far before. Let me see if I can get the rest of you caught up at this point. There was a day when the B'nai Elohim, now you have to admit that's plural, the sons, not son, not a son of Elohim, but B'nai the sons of Elohim, how many there are. With me so far? Who are they and why do they have to report to Yahweh? Well, let me give you an idea. In Luke chapter 3, which is the genealogical table of our Savior about basing on the fact of who he came from, who he was the son of, does he have a genealogical right? Because you see, if you're going to be a king, you've got to have genealogy. Genealogies are worthless if you're not a king. Kings have to prove that they are descended from kings. Peons do not come from kings. You have to have genealogy. So that's why in Matthew and in Luke we have genealogy lists, but the genealogy lists is work from opposite ends. Matthew does it from one end, and Luke does it from another. But in Luke, it says very interesting thing. It took it all the way from Mary, took it back, who was the daughter of, who was the son 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 of, all the way back. And finally, we get to the end and it says, who was the son of Adam, who was the B'nai Elohim? Adam is the only person in the Bible that was called a B'nai Elohim in Hebrew. Adam. Now, none of the sons of Adam have ever been called the many Elohim because when he fell it says he had a son after his own image fallen and you see Elohim can't fall so no fallen man can ever be called the Bene Elohim 
Therefore, Adam was the only B'nai Elohim on this planet. Now, we do know that he was put here for a specific purpose. One, he was put here to be a king. Two, he was to be the vice regent of the eternal on this planet. Now, if Adam was the B'nai Elohim, and had he not have sinned, he would have been right here with the rest of the B'nai Elohim, which implies that each one of them were like Adam on a different planet. Yes. In the Book of Enoch, yeah, it talks about it talks about the uh, and I can't remember where or what or exactly how it is, but you'll just have to suffer through with it. Okay. Uh, <coughs> there was beings that was brought in from all over the universe in the last, the last uh, hurrah that came to observe and be with the judging of the world. Mm -hmm. Is this the B'nai Elohim from the universe? Is that who they are? Uh, yes and no. Partly correct. Partly not correct. Okay. Um, you're referring to First Enoch six. I, it, it was right in there, yeah. And also chapter one. Now, now see the Holy Spirit's putting this Bible study together. See, none of you even understand him. See, all of you are a part of what the Holy Spirit's doing. See, mm -hmm. see he's weaving a thought. He wants to get you thinking. Except I'm about five minutes ahead of you. <laughs> the blessing now, in Enoch to recall what you now correct me if I'm wrong I think I hear what you're saying I want to make sure I understand what you're asking yeah. it says the blessed the Enoch chapter 1 verse 1 the blessing of Enoch with which he blessed the elect and the righteous who would be present on the day of tribulation at the time of the removal of all of the ungodly ones now see, Satan hates this book. This book used to be in the canon. This book was part of the original Bible. It was removed. That's why he always said, don't take anything from my word. This book was removed. It's part of the original canon. Enoch was given this revelation before the flood, carried by Noah through the flood, handed down to Shem and given to Abraham, and Abraham kept it within part of the oracles of the children of Israel as part of their heritage. In fact, the latter part of the book of Enoch literally says the fragments of Noah still carries the title on it to this day and it even states in the ancient Hebrew writings that they were brought over on the ark. The ark of Noah carried with it the library. The library was communicated from Noah to Shem and then bestowed upon Abraham in Abraham's seed. That's why there's more to this than what meets the eye. Anyway, I want you to notice how this contradicts church theology. The blessings of Enoch with which he blessed the elect and the righteous who would be present on the day of tribulation at the time of the removal of all of the ungodly ones. Now, not the removal of the righteous, but the removal of the unrighteous. Now, in Matthew 24, it says that when he comes, he's going to separate the tares from the wheat but it says he's not going to remove the wheat said so he's going to remove the tares yet the church has got us being removed but the bible doesn't talk about us being removed it talks about the tares being removed in the book of enoch it tells you the ungodly ones will be removed somebody's going to remove them out of their place and i'll tell you how to tell who does it and when it happens and that's part of the interpretation of the book of revelation which i'm going to maybe give you tonight Enoch, the blessed and righteous man of Yahweh, took up the, his parable while his eyes were open and he saw and said, This is a holy vision from the heavens, plural, which the angels showed me and I heard from them everything and I understood. I look not for this generation but for the distant one that is coming. I speak about the elect ones and concerning them and I took up with a parable saying, The Elohim of the universe, the holy and great one, will come forth from his dwelling which is the highest 
heaven. And from there he will march upon Mount Sinai and appear in his camp emerging from heaven with a mighty power and everyone shall be afraid and watchers shall quiver and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Mountain and high places will fall down and be frightened and the high hills shall be made low and they shall melt like honeycomb before the flame and earth shall be rent asunder and all that is upon the earth shall perish and there shall be a judgment upon all including the righteous. And to all the righteous he will grant peace. He will preserve the elect, and kindness shall be upon them. They shall all belong to Elohim, and they shall prosper and be blessed, and the light of Elohim shall shine unto them. Behold, he will arrive with ten million of the holy ones in order to execute judgment upon all. Now, was that the verse that you were talking about? Okay, which is, by the way, this verse is what's quoted by Jude in the book of Jude in your Bible. Jude is quoting from this book. Chapter 1, verse 9 of the book of Enoch is quoted by Jude, which means that Jude took this as scripture and quotes it as such. He will destroy the wicked one and censor all flesh on account of everything they have done, that which the sinners and the wicked ones committed against him. Okay, So he's coming with millions of these holy ones to execute judgment. In Matthew 24, he's coming with angels, messengers, who will come with swords in their hand. There's going to be holy ones. There's not just going to be us, folks. The, you talk about a military... You have never seen military army like what Yahweh has. There's not a war on this earth that ever will equal in power, that will equal in prestige, that will equal in, in sight and sound the divine holy war. Now, the B'nai Elohim, I believe, this is just my personal opinion, were beings on Adam's order who were created to be the heads over his physical creation and were placed in various levels of his creation. Adam being placed here. But Adam being placed here was placed here for a reason because Satan was bound here in the second dimension, which we spoke of on the earlier tape, and where the second dimension is. So the tree of knowledge was planted in the second dimension. Not all of the second dimension was corrupted. Only a portion of it. A portion of it was not. Adam's job was to redeem it. Adam blew it as a B'nai Elohim. He fell. Now, Lucifer, when Adam fell, took Adam's birthright. Satan has the keys of death and hell. And that's why when Christ died and rose from the dead, he took back the keys that were given to Adam. See, Adam, simply by rebelling, forfeited his divine title upon this earth, giving rulership to Satan. So, when these B'nai Elohim went and reported in on what are called quarterly cycles, called a business meeting, when the heads of state all gathered together to meet under Yahweh's specialty, meeting place, wherever this place was in the universe, Satan says, well, I've got the authority from planet Earth, I'm going to go there too. I'm a rotten figure. Now, uh, now, did that answer your question enough for me to continue on? Okay. Uh, in First Enoch chapter 6, it goes on and does exactly what it says in Genesis 6. There was a day when the B'nai Elohim came down to the daughters of Adam and produced seed, which became the giants that lived in those days. Monstrosities between these, um, some of the B'nai Elohim who got attracted to those upon this planet, and they were enough like them that I mean, after all, if they were B'nai Elohim, I believe that the B'nai Elohim were all of one class. Now, the B'nai Elohim shouted 
at the foundations of this earth not realizing that one of the greatest Bnei Elohim was about to be created in his image so we have these creatures who lived in the realm of eternity and who were familiar with eternity and whose job is to service between eternity and time they are sort of in between um, we shared this with you before when we went into the book of Daniel let's go to Daniel 10 I'll show you what I'm talking about In the third year, Daniel 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, or Sabbath bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled and in the four and twentieth day of the first month as I was by the side of the great river which is Hedekel then I lifted up my eyes looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen white linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz his body was also like the burrow his face is the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and if you look in Revelation 1 it's the same description of Christ in his eternal glory in his human body but Christ lived pre-existent to Mary Christ was a manifested called in the Old Testament the angel of Yahweh and he was the one who walked in the garden with Adam he was the one who appeared to Moses in the burning bush this was the one whom the 70 elders saw uh, in the vision and every divine vision of deity was nothing than the pre-existent manifestation of deity or of Christ the person who created everything else in his image including the B'nai Elohim this is you know the universe is a very big thing folks you and I are just we, we, we've been slaves for so long little peons for so long it's just hard for us to think big if you lived on the other side of the world and you lived among the high potentates you'd be thinking the only people you can talk to are kings you know you think big I mean for you to throw a three million dollar party is just peanuts I mean, for you to say, well, I'm going to go out tomorrow and have a bash for $3 million, you, you, you wouldn't be able to do it. But if you were a king and some of the money that some of the people in this world have, uh, it wouldn't mean nothing to you. Well, our Heavenly Father is above any of the kings of this earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's massively wealthy. And when he creates anything, they're massively wealthy. When Adam was made, he had the whole earth. It was all his. And it was given to his seed, his posterity, to prosper in it, in a glorified condition. So here comes what I believe was Christ in his pre-incarnate days. His body also was like the burrow, his face is the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision and there remaineth no strength in me for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words and when I heard the voice of his words then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face towards the ground. Behold a hand touched me which set me upon my knees and upon the palm of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy Elohim, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now, if you go back to Daniel 9, it says in Daniel 9 verse 3, I set my face unto Yahweh Elohim, to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes and I prayed unto Yahweh my Elohim and made my confession and said now at that point where it says said this is the prayer of Daniel now, if you want to know how a prophet prays simply read this prayer and I challenge you pray it with emotion and feeling and put a timer on and see how long it takes you you'll find out that it will take you approximately 
three minutes to pray this prayer. Now, go back to Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand, thy words were heard, I am come. In other words, the moment that Daniel started to pray this prayer, this great personage in white was sent. But it took him three weeks to get there, didn't it? Now he left the throne of heaven. The prayer was heard how fast? No, the prayer was heard instantly. See, when you say Yahweh, how long does it take for him to hear it? Instantly. In other words, interdimensional space does not have space limit to it, or time limits. You understand? Yahweh can hear your call that fast. But now, in order for him to get to you, he's got to go through certain zones. That's why I was teaching you earlier the ten heavens. It, he's got to go through the channels, so to speak, to get prayer answered. Now, one of the channels he's got to get through when we're in a fallen state is what we read about here. Verse 13. But the prince, or the archon, is the word in the original. Same word for principality in Ephesians 12. I mean Ephesians 6, 12, and 13. We wrestle against what? Principalities. Well, here's an example of one right here. Daniel 10, 13. You could actually put the word principality there. It's the same word in the original. But the principality, the archon of the kingdom of Persia. Did the kingdom of Persia, was it a literal kingdom? But was it a literal kingdom? Yes. Was it a physical kingdom? Yes. Did it have real flesh and blood people in it? Yes. Was there such a thing as a Persian Empire in history? Yes. But was there a power behind it? Yes. Yeah. Behind all physical power, there's a spirit power coming from some dimension. You see that? But the prince... Now, if this was Christ... I'm gonna, I want to show you something. If this was Christ, if this was his pre-incarnate glory... And it took him three weeks. Now it only takes one second for our voice to get all the way up to the 10th heaven. But for him to come back, it took three weeks for him to get to Daniel. Now if it took Christ himself three weeks to get to Daniel, how long do you think it's going to get take you without Christ to get a prayer answer? I mean, some of you just never thought about it that way, did you? Okay. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Personally, how does a fallen principality withstand Christ? You ever, you ever think about that? Mm -hmm. well, doesn't it seem to you that how Christ would have to get out of my way? You ever wondered why evil stays? You ever wonder why it's just so hard? See, we've never thought it through. We preach such a Mickey Mouse gospel. If evil is so easy to control, then how come we have so much problem with it? Folks, this thing's... When, when, when Christ in all of his purity, and all of his power, he is... Now, and I hope you get this, the body that he had through the Virgin Mary... Do you realize that it couldn't die? It didn't have any sin in it. You can't destroy a body that has no sin in it. In Matthew 17, he was glorified before he ever went to the cross. Light shone through his body. Light. He was transfigured among them. He showed them his eternal glory. There it is, boy. He's sinned. This is who I really am. They saw it. It was glorious. Yet, in that same body, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the pressure was so great upon him that he began to sweat, as it were, drops of blood literally pouring through the capillaries and going through the texture of his skin. That's pressure. Now, he had no sin. And he was deity. But he experienced pressure to the breaking point that his own sinless body was about to break. And then you wonder sometimes why it's so hard on you. 
That's why he said, I've been where you are. I want you to understand. But I have defeated those powers. Now Daniel was pre-cross. We should not have this problem anymore in our life. Technically. And I said that for a reason. See, some of you will sit there and pray for something for a whole year. Even pre-Christ it only took three weeks. You understand that? Before the cross, it took three weeks. Then why do we as Christians who have the cross and the resurrection, why does it take us five years? Something we must not understand. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So, and I challenge you, study Revelation chapter 1 and study this chapter and see if the two people aren't alike. And most commentators even accept the fact that this was Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. Now, if it is, it may not be, but if it is, if it is, I want you to think about something. He said personally, this single demonic archon withstood him for 21 days. It took him 21 days to get around this person. That's a lot of pressure. That must have been one strong archon. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. But the prince, the archon of the kingdom of Persia, withstood me one and 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, or one of the chief archons, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the what? Latter, Latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Now, the vision that he was going to come and give Daniel concerns what was to happen to his people in these days. In these days. Does the devil want you to know what the devil's going to do in these days? No. So the devil's going to fight this, isn't he? he number one, he doesn't want you to know. Do you know why he doesn't want you to know? He can fool us. Well, he can fool us. Um, that's true. But if you did know, well, what then? You, you could probably prepare a defense, couldn't you? Yes. You could probably outwhip him. If, you knew, if any nation knew they were going to be attacked, they'd build up their armory. They'd build up their weaponry. Now, Father calls us soldiers. We're called into a war. The greatest war of all history is about to take place. You have not yet seen a war like the war that's coming up. Now, in Ephesians 6, where it says, put on the armor, he's talking military words, folks. This is military warfare. You better accept the fact you're in a war. Satan is out to get you. He's, he wants to wipe your face in the mud with your weakness. The Father's got a job to do, doesn't he? Now, where did all this come from and where is it going? I'm trying to give you the big picture. In the beginning, none of this was here. How did it get here? Now, one of the, word, one of the things that uh, Enid wanted to ask, if I got it correctly, was, if there was no sin at that time and there was nothing but the B'nai Elohim and everything was good, there were no archons in the first age, there was no sin, there was no evil, there was nothing, there was nothing negative. Can you imagine that? I mean, there was nothing in any realm. Where did Lucifer come up with the idea to blow it when it was nobody else? You ever try to figure that one out? Where did he get it from? How? how? If there were no archons, he, he was not tempted. Because there was nothing to tempt him. There was no devil to tempt the devil. I mean, Adam at least had an excuse. He was tempted. <clears throat> Lucifer was not tempted. No one tempted Lucifer. There wasn't anything in the creation to tempt him. How did he, in the presence of pure holiness, pure power, pure beauty, ever get to the place where he sinned? Was that one of your questions? I got it right. Okay. Well, is there an answer to that? I could say no and just keep on going. Well, yes there is. Isaiah 14 again. Now see, you know, we spend a lot of time in Isaiah 14, don't we? But pretty soon you're going to find out it's pretty heavy. Now we already spent an hour on it today. Now we're going to go back to Isaiah 14 and look at something else. How art thou fallen from heaven? Now, with Isaiah 14, verse 12, you have to connect with it 
uh, Ezekiel 28. So put Ezekiel 28 in there. Let's compare two things together here. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Get that? He was perfect like everything else. He was beautiful. How could a being created, you knew you had no existence till the Creator created you. But up in verse 12 it said he was the sum of wisdom. That meant Father just DNA coded him with wisdom. He had the answer to everything. In his realm he was the wisest of all there was. He was the sum of what? Wisdom. Now, what did Solomon have? Wisdom. Wisdom. Alright. Now, back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we read something. Now the serpent was more subtle or was, was, subtle, was more subtle than any beast of the field. In other words, out of all the beasts of the field, and remember the word beast there is not beast at all. It's not talking about an animal or a snake. The word is literally living creature who lived in the field. This was the wisest of all of them. But the phrase is identical to Ezekiel 28. He was, a full, he was full of wisdom. And he was perfect in beauty. He, he looked in the mirror and he says, Wow, look at that man. I am beautiful. Now, in verse 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in thee. Now, it didn't say sin, it said iniquity, which meant that something became bent inside of him because iniquity means bending. Okay? Now look, by the multitude of thy merchandise, what does that mean? You know he was a merchandiser? He's a merchant. What do merchants do today? They sell. They sell. Buy. What, what is the city in the book of Revelation chapter 18? What is the great city uh, really, really for? What, what do they do? It's the city of commerce, isn't it? It's a commercial city. The city of the world. They do trade all over the world. The trafficking. You have the personification of what Lucifer did before he fell. He was a merchandiser. He was the greatest retailer that ever was. I knew you couldn't trust sales. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He was a salesman. By the multitude of thy merchandise. Now, his merchandise, meaning that he, what, he had so many unique gifts. So many things that he could do. They have filled the midst of thee with violence not, not, it, 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 that's a bad word there. It just filled him with just, he was consumed with what he could do. And thou hast sinned. He sinned. Now to sin means to make a choice against a standard or to violate a given standard. Now let's find out what that standard was. Uh, verse 17 uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 17 thy heart was lifted up because of what thy beauty thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness so he corrupted himself how did he do that Isaiah 14 Verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said, where? In thine heart. Now, it tells you in verse 17, his heart was lifted up. But in Isaiah 12, 13, 14, 13, it tells you what in his heart made him rise up. I will. Two words. 
I will. No created being in the universe ever said, I will. Lucifer was the first to say, I will. He got Adam and Eve to say, I will. The first thing a child will do upon expressing his sin nature is defy your will. That little child will continue to say throughout his life, I will, I will not, I won't do it, I will. That is the essence of sin. Yes? In the marriage ceremony, they say will thou. Is that the same? Yes and no. Okay, now, we are free moral agents in the sense that I have and can make choices. He's not against choices as long as it is contained within his will. I can will to do his will. It's when I make a choice to will against the will that it becomes sin. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, Father created us with the ability to will, including the angels. Now, some of the angels sin. The Bible says that Lucifer took one-third of the angels of heaven with him. One-third. That meant two-thirds didn't go. But one-third of them followed him. Do you understand what it would take for one-third of the angels to follow him? He must have been some powerful oratory to actually take away at least one-third of the creation of Elohim. Knowing they were all, he was the creator. Mm -hmm. Lucifer himself being a created being. The masterpiece of subtlety. He corrupted his wisdom. By his wisdom, he found a way to be so sneaky. And from that point on, his will is now to do everything in the exact opposite manner that Father wills. So when Christ came, what did he say in the garden? Not my will be done. Now I want to ask you a question. When Christ said, not my will be done, did Christ have a will? Yeah. Yeah. Could he have sinned? No. Because no. he was deity. Therefore, whatever he willed would have been righteous. You with me? Right. Now, if whatever he willed would have been righteous, then why did he say, not my will? Because even though his will was righteous and there was nothing wrong with it, he still didn't want to do his will. He wanted to do his Father's will. So the key to being in Christ is not my will, but thy will, and only those who say thy will be done on a consistent basis become the overcomers. So overcoming is the ability to say thy will, not my will, even when there's nothing wrong with what I'm willing. If I understand that what I'm willing to do, even though not wrong, is against what I know Father wants me to do. Yes? Okay, um, since Lucifer corrupted himself, the blood of Yeshua guarantees that this will never ever happen again. That's right. It, it'll never happen. Again. Never happen again. But then, but Father knew that Lucifer was going to corrupt himself. That's right. But um, you want to know why? <laughs> yes. Okay. In the first creation, he cannot create himself. Nothing was born. It was created. He cannot create himself. He himself is holy. He cannot sin. You cannot create non-sinning. Because that is part of eternity. But you can birth it. That's why Yeshua was birthed. 
That's why Christ came. Had there been no sin, Christ would have still come to give us birth. He would not have had to die, but he would have still come to give us birth. So if Adam and so there has to be a sin, second. He would have came anyway to give us the birth, and that would have yes. guaranteed eternal life. Yes, right. that's right. Wow. But there wouldn't have been a third, third coming then. In other words, when he had come, yeah. there had to been sin. Yeah. Then that would he would have eliminate him. Yeah, if Adam had not have sinned, Christ would have still come to be received, to bring birth, to produce in us divine birth, because it is the divine birth that causes us to be able to not sin. Now you can find this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And he would have come back on the white horse and not on the donkey. You're right. First John. Wow. Correct. 1 John 5, 4. Uh, five, yeah, 5-4. Five, For whatsoever is born of Elohim, didn't say whosoever, it says whatsoever. How many know there's a difference between who and what? Right. doesn't say who's born, it says what is born. What is born? I mean, what is born? You should know this. Why? What's born? That which is born of the spirit. 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 Yeah. spirit. Is spirit. What is born? What is born? Spirit. The spirit. You're born again of the spirit. For whatsoever is born overcomes the world. What overcomes the world? Spirit. What is born? Spirit. Which is your spirit. Right? Mm -hmm. Know what it says? Um, there's another verse I'm looking for too and I can't, uh, can't quite think of. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. 1 John chapter 3. Just go back a chapter couple chapters. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. Now here the word is whosoever, not whatsoever. You gotta, you gotta really catch these words, folks. Mm -hmm. Whosoever. Who's, who's born again now? Who's born again? Who? Mm -hmm. Who? People. You. Yeah, we are. Yeah, you. Not what now? You. Whosoever is born of Elohim, what do you read? Does not commit sin. Uh, maybe I'm not born again. <laughs> but you said at one time that the original though in this verse was whatsoever. Is that what I said? Yeah. <laughs> That's what my notes say. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. I was wondering if he was going to pick that up. Whatsoever is born of Elohim does not commit sin. Now watch. For his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of Elohim. He also said that it cannot sin because it is born of Elohim. That's right. Meaning the spirit? Your spirit. Your spirit can't sin. That's why if you walk in the spirit, you can't sin. But you've got to make a choice to walk in the spirit. Which just about brings us to the Bible study I was going to give you tonight. That was 1 John 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. That which is born does not commit sin. Now, that which is created can do you see the distinction? Mm -hmm. Therefore, to those who are not born again, they must be judged and sin will be brought to an end whereby they will lose their will to sin. We who accept by choice to walk in the Spirit will be purified 
rise above, conquer, be an overcomer, and be able to rise to the higher levels because we've chosen the way of Christ. Consequently, we will never sin again because we will lose that ability to sin by learning how to walk in the Spirit because I've now been born with Father's nature because Father cannot sin. Father cannot sin. Period. But He cannot create somebody to not sin. He can only birth somebody to not sin, but only that which is born. Now, the first Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, let's, let's go to that now. Now, we can, now it's going to make sense to some of you. 1 Corinthians 15. Forty-five, First Corinthians fifteen, forty-five, and so it is written: the first man, Adam, was made a living what? Soul. Soul. Second dimension. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural or soulish, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is Yahweh from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. You were born of the flesh. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. You were born of the spirit. As we have borne the image of the earth, earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. How? Birth. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and what? Blood. Blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, which is the Feast of Trumpets. Yes. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, you're going to bear the image of the heavenly, aren't you? When you are changed, when this body now becomes adaptable to your spirit, you will never be able to sin again. Which means you are going back to the order of first things. Now, if there was a time when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves in his kingdom, and Satan came also among them, the point is that those B'nai Elohim still meet. The Father cannot have his final meeting until the B'nai Elohim of this planet are in place. Now, the B'nai Elohim of the other planets or other dimensions. Now I said a word, I told somebody on the way up there to eat earlier today, so the rest of you that weren't in the van, you didn't get this, but out of the various dimensions that are, that are available and that are made, each dimension becomes greater than the next dimension. Okay? The physical creation it's like that. All of this physical dimension with all of its millions of light years, all of space, everything physical that the whole world knows about is simply just a little teeny weeny thing like that. The second dimension is a little larger and contained in the first. Second surrounds it. The third is larger yet, contains all of that. The fourth dimension is larger and on it goes until you finally reach that big overall thing is finally known as Yahweh. Okay? In other words, the higher you go in the dimensions, the bigger it gets, the bigger the universe. Okay? The B'nai Elohim were centered all through the first creation, all through the first planetary system. Astronomers will tell you that every star in the heavens, which is nothing more than a sun, just like our own sun, that at least they, they, they believe this is in documentation that every other star has planets revolving around it just like planets around our sun. 
and that they assume that they have life. So they assume when they see UFOs that these are simply people coming to us from other planets. Not planets within our solar system, but planets within the universe of the physical dimension. The only thing that they fail to realize is that when the UFOs manifest, they come in and out of the dimension. They, 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 they don't come from outer space, they come from inner space. Because they can, see to be, they can actually be seen on photographic film to be actually coming into manifestation. They're not coming as a movement in space, they are coming from something that is not space into space, and you actually see them materialize on slow film. Meaning they are beings who come from an inner dimension. The second dimension, which is where Satan lives. But there are also beings who come from the third dimension and from the fourth dimension, which are known as the angels. The fifth dimension where the archangels are. And you and I are going into the fifth dimension. The overcomers are going into the fifth dimension. Now, in the book of Revelation, each of the heavens... Every vision begins with a heavenly scene. Somewhere in one of the heavens. Now, Lucifer, as we laid out for you earlier um, from Isaiah 14. Anybody get tired of Isaiah 14 by now? Verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven? Now, to fall means to go down. It's a word meaning to go down. When he comes, we're going to be caught up. We're going to, there's an upness. But how many know that in reality, it's not an up-down situation, it's in or out? So to go up is to go in. To go down is to go out. Am I losing anybody? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, heaven, I, I made a series of tapes some time back called Heaven is Not Up. The reason I say that is because when, if, if, you, if you just simply understand the, the planetary system, the earth, and when he comes, if he were to come down to get us and he stood right here, we that are right here on this part of earth would go up to meet him. But the people who live down here in China, if they went up, they'd have to go through the earth to get to him. But because they're standing upside down, <laughs> but they're not upside down. <laughs> they're standing right side up. It's we who are upside down. But you see, in our consciousness, it does not appear that way. But somewhere, every 12 hours on this, every 12 hours on this planet, we are literally upside down. But at any time, are you aware that you're upside down? Of course not. Or some of you are actually standing sideways in space. You're standing that way. You're, you're literally going outwards in space. That's, that's, that's reality. Now, for this person on this side of the planet to go up, he has to go this way. For the person who lives on this side of the planet to go up is to go that way. For the person on this side of the planet to go up, he'd have to go this way. Well, if, if, if every... If, one-fourth of the earth went this way, and one-fourth of the earth went this way, and one-fourth of the earth went that way, and one-fourth of the earth went that way, none of us would ever meet him. Right? So in order to go up and meet him, we must therefore have to go in to the next dimension. Doom. Not doom, but doom. See? Not, not over the head, but with the heart, understanding that we're going as a magnet being attracted to him, we simply are drawn to him because he's not in space. And we'll no longer be a space being. We're interdimensional space beings. How in the world do you think you're going to be able to float in the air? Space beings cannot float in air. Things in space do not, I mean, physical things do not float without some kind of power. And if you're going to all of a sudden ascend up, now Christ was able to ascend up. How was he ascending up? Because his body was not limited to the molecular, gravitational, electromagnetism of this planet or of the first dimension. Now, if I'm walking in the Spirit, does my Spirit have power over the magnetism of this earth and over its electromagnetic field? Do I? Yeah. yeah. So it has no bearing upon me. Now, if I'm walking in the Spirit, I can 
appear and disappear at will. Yeah. It's been said that Buddhist monks do that. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Well, they learned the tree, didn't they? But they learned how to do it without Christ. You're going to do it with Christ. There's a big difference. But you see, even if they do it, they can't get out of the second dimension. We get, we're, we're doing it in the third. I'm just trying to teach you a higher level of thinking. When Lucifer fell, he fell out of. To fall, in our conception, is to go down because in space, we only think of falling as a downward condition. Okay? Um, so what I want you to see here is that it says, How art thou fallen from heaven? So the heaven he was in, he fell out of. So he was in a heaven that he ruled and governed. Now, according to the word, let's go back to Genesis 1. I want to show you something. I haven't talked about this too much. It's the fourth day creative act. Um, verse 14. Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. Let there be lights where? Of the what? Heavens. Be lights in the heaven. To divide the day from the night, let them be for signs and for seasons. The word for seasons there is feast. Moedim 4150. And for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, which we call what? And the lesser light to rule the night. What was that? The moon. And he made the stars also. Can you see that? So the heavens include... Star, I mean a sun, a moon, and stars. You got that? Mm -hmm. Now, if that is true of the first heaven, are there stars and moons and and a sun, moon, and stars for the second heaven? Yeah. How about for the third? Mm -hmm. How about for the fourth? Yeah. How about for the fifth? Mm -hmm. Oh, huh. now, now. Okay, Matthew 24. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the what? Sun be darkened. And the moon? I'll give her light. And the stars? They'll fall. Now, do you really think that a star, which is a sun, by the way, the smallest sun is ten times bigger than this earth. If a sun fell on this earth, what do you think would happen to it? Obliterated. It obliterated, even before it even got here. The gravitational pull of a larger unit upon the earth would cause the earth to be totally disintegrated. But I read in the Bible that the earth is going to go on forever. So evidently, the stars that fall from heaven are not physical stars. Where is it? Genesis 37, where it talks about the original sun, moon, and stars. Is that where it is? Let's see. Um, yeah. Genesis 37, verse um, 5. Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun... And the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. Now, what was he? Joseph was the twelfth son. He saw the eleven stars. So the son was who? According to this dream, what was the sun? No. 
his father Jacob, who was Israel. Israel would be the son. You with me? Israel would be the son. Who was the moon? His mother. Who were the stars? His brothers. And if eleven bowed down to him, he'd be the twelfth. Right? Now, go back to Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now again, we have the sun, moon, and stars, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Is it referring to physical sun, physical moon, physical stars? Or is it referring to dominion? Mm -hmm. What is the symbol of the emperor of Japan? The sun. The sun. What controls this whole earth? The sun. The sun. This is called the sun system, the solar system. Everything that lives, lives by the power of the sun. Mm -hmm. What is the greatest image of the sun there is? That's why it's called the great light. Okay? So now we have to figure out who the sun, moon, and stars are. Now hold, hold Revelation 12. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Okay. You having fun with the Bible study or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is what I've been wanting. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith Yahweh, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Notice what happens after the prophecy. What does it say? I will show wonders where? In heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. Next verse, please. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of Yahweh come. Do you know how many people take that literally and refer to a literal sun or moon at all? Who is the sun to this world? It's the church. And the moon will be turned to blood. That means a bloodbath will come. Mm -hmm. Now, Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder. Now, by the way, just take a strong concordance. Go look up the word sun. Look up the word moon. Look up the word stars. You're going to be amazed as you look to the scriptures that whenever Yahweh appears in judgment, when it says that he, re he turned the sun dark, it meant whatever the ruling power was in that day, it was removed. The sun of that empire was removed. It meant the ruling people of that day. The sun is the ruler of that kingdom. So the sun in any heaven is the ruler of that heaven. The sun was designed to what? Rule the day. What does the moon rule? Night. Rules the night. Now that's rulers. Sun and moon are rulers. Now here's a woman which is Israel. Clothed with the sun. She's ruling. This is redeemed Israel. Now if you don't believe me, how many understand Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant? Right? Everybody understand. Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant. Very few people ever read Isaiah 54. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 54 go hand in hand. You cannot separate them. Now let's go back to Isaiah 54 and you'll see why. Now look at the last verse in Isaiah 53. Last verse in Isaiah 53 was verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Notice what was poured out unto death, his soul or his spirit? His soul. Okay. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His soul went to Sheol, his body was put into the grave. He poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, whoever put the word 54 in there, 
came years after the Bible was already, before when Isaiah had already written this thing. In the days of Christ, there was no 54 there. It was the continuation of the prophecy. What happens following the fact that he made intercession for the transgressors? Sing, O barren, thou that did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that did not travail with child. Now we're talking about somebody bringing forth with child. What happens in Revelation 12? Revelation 12, Isaiah 54, go hand in hand. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith Yahweh. Enlarge the place of thy tent, let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand, and on the left thy seed shall inherit the nations, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore, for thy maker is thine husband... Who are we talking about? Yahweh of hosts is His name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Elohim of the whole earth, shall He be called. And Yahweh hath called thee as a woman, or wife in the original, <coughs> forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy Elohim, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith Yahweh thy Redeemer. Who in the world is he talking to? House of Israel. House of Israel. Israel was cast off because of her sins. But when Christ died and rose from the dead, Israel became redeemed. The whole New Testament is the redemption of the house of Israel, which now is talking, this is talking about the house of Israel over the house of Judah. Redeemed house of Israel is now in a greater place than the house of Judah. The children of the desolate are more than the children of the married. Judah is still married because they keep the Sabbath and the feast. But Israel has been redeemed. Judah hasn't been redeemed yet. Israel's been redeemed. There's now more children. There's more Christians than there are Jews. Yes. Right. Right. There's more Christians. Sing thou barren. You're going to bring forth children. Right? Mm -hmm. Verse 11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, lay thy foundation with sapphires. Go read it in Revelation 21. The redeemed. And I will make thy windows of agates and the gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of Yahweh and great shall be the peace of thy children. And then you go down to verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. It's referring to the saved Christian. Now go back to Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman. Who is this house of Israel? Saved Israel. Clothed with the sun moon under her feet. That's the feminine side of the church that gives birth. That's the soul winner. And upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. See, they, they picked this up in prophecy, picking up what was given in Genesis and Isaiah. So when you read about the sun being darkened, you have to find out what sun is it talking about. The sun of the righteous or the sun of the wicked? <coughs> Today in this planet, the one world government is the sun of that system. That sun will be turned into darkness. <coughs> Bless you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Did you say that Israel is a feminine side of the church? What did you say about the feminine side of the church? The moon. Jacob was the sun. Jacob's wife was the moon in the vision. That was the feminine <laughs> side of the marriage. Father uses types and shadows, not literalness. See, part of our problem is that we think in terms of literalness rather than in images and types and shadows. We need to see this as a type and shadow of the whole 
perspective of what we're talking about. The mother. Now, in the book of Revelation, how many women do you find? Mm-hmm. Only two. You find the pure woman and you find the whore. Mm-hmm. Well, in the Old Testament, you found two whores. The house of Israel and the house of Judah were both called whores. <laughs> Depending on their position before Yahweh, at one time they were likened unto females and another time they were likened unto males. Don't get too literal. Depends on the relationship, whether they're male or female. The sun is the male side. The moon is the female side. Twelve stars are the ruling side. We have to understand that distinction in prophecy. Are you with me so far? So here was a woman clothed with the sun. Now, in every institution, there is a sun, therefore. There's a political sun. Today it's the government. That sun will be darkened. The moon, the institutions that govern that government will be pulled down, to be turned into blood. He'll destroy it. And their stars, their overcomers, their bright shining ones, Secretary of State, all of them are going to fall to the earth. So when you read the book of Revelation, Father is talking in poetic language. Now, earlier we started with Romans 1 verse 20. Let's go back to Romans 1 verse 20 and let me show you something. Romans 1 verse 20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are what but that are made anybody know what that word is in the original It says that everything that Yahweh made, the Greek word is poema, from which we get the word poem. It means poetic handiwork. Everything that is made is designed to be a poem or a love song to you. Father's poem to you. So that you can see his handiwork, how he operates. But all of that is simply type and shadow of what he wants to do inside of you. The creation of a literal son is merely a poetic side of his nature teaching you that at some point if you will overcome in Christ you will become a son. In the resurrection we shall be sons. What were the B'nai Elohim? Sons. Now, Isaiah 14 let's look at something very interesting. You know your Bible pretty soon. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now the word son of the morning there is the same phrase in Hebrew as Job 38.7 that we started this whole Bible study with. The morning stars sang together. Morning stars. Now what is an overcomer called in the book of Revelation? Morning star. What is Christ called in Revelation 22? He is the bright and morning star. Why? He's the head of everything. Everything that was made somehow expresses his headship, but he's the head of everything. So Lucifer was part of the morning star system. Can you see that? Son of the morning. Verse 12. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, meaning he wanted to get higher than he was. I will exalt my throne above the what? Stars. Stars. So the stars were above him. Adam was a star. When the star fell, the star fell to earth. Lucifer is the bright morning star. That title had to be reclaimed and redeemed by Christ to redeem the office and to whoever conquers Satan reclaims the office. That's why there's a war between you and the demons and Satan. Because every time you overcome, you are taking an office away from Satan. And he doesn't like it. And for every office you can take from Satan, you will be lifted higher and higher and higher and higher in the overcoming ranks. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars. He's not talking about the literal astronomical stars. Stars represent overcomers, beings who shine bright for Yahweh. When you express your love to a hurting soul, at that moment you are a star. When you speak the word of comfort to a hurting soul, when you pray and intercede for somebody, you are at that moment a bright and shining star. Not in the eyes of the world. And sometimes you compare yourself to the rock stars, wrestling stars, football stars, baseball stars, basketball stars, sports stars, any kind of stars that are out there. Folks, those are the wrong kind of stars. Father has his stars. They're called overcomers. You're to be stars. You won't fall to the earth because you're not of the earth system. You're of a higher system. You're in another dimension. Father's going to overthrow this first dimension. The sons of this dimension are going to be overthrown. But we're sons of a higher dimension. Can you see? I just want you to see you're not of the old order. You're of a new order. We're a new creation in Christ. We have arrived. You need to see yourself as stronger than. So when Christ who dealt with the prince of darkness had not yet come to die for sin, meaning He had to come through a sin barrier. Do you understand that it's hard for Yahweh to break through a sin barrier to bring deliverance? But when He died on the cross, He arose triumphant over all sin. But Father no longer comes to you through a sin barrier. He removes sin, lifts you into the third heaven, and when you walk in the Spirit, you have direct access and can get direct answers same day. Satan's going to try to even stop you from that. Part of being a star is the ability to get your prayers answered right away by understanding who you are. Father wants you to know your position. So let's close with Revelation 4. After this I looked and behold the door was opened where? How many of you would like to go through that door? That, that's a vortex. That door open. You can go right into heaven. You already have that ability, folks. And the first voice, first voice, not the second, not the third, not the fourth, first voice, which I heard was as of a shofar. First thing you're going to hear is a shofar. And a shofar talks. And here's what the shofar said. Come up. Don't go down. How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? But the call to the church is, come up. Come up. Now, what did Lucifer want? He wanted to go up. He wanted to ascend. See, the way up is down and the way down is up. He that humbleth himself, I will exalt and to him that exalteth himself, see that word self? He that exalteth himself shall be humbled. He wanted to ascend up. He didn't have the right attitude. He therefore was kicked out of even what he had. But in Christ, we have been